tools relatively quickly. Um, were you about to say something? No, I was just going to say okay. Um, so the Bible, okay, so just to kind of review something that I said last week or two weeks ago. So the Bible is the word of God, yes, but translations aren't word for word, okay? The reason why I bring this up is because, you know, there's this idea that there's word for word translations, which is kind of true, but not really because, um, because, uh, a translation can't be word for word, the word of God, because... That's not how translations work. You, you, you have the original text, and you translate it over. So it's go there's, there's not really going to be a word for word. There's going to be whether it accurately portrays what the original text was trying to say. So there's two typical ways that, that, that translations will try to do this. The first one is they'll try to, say, try to be as precise as possible, but it's impossible to be word for word. Be because, like I said, words can be translated in so many different ways and said in different ways and cultures understand things differently. But then there's other translations that don't try to be precise. What they try to do is they just try to be understandable. So like the New Living Translation is a good example of this. The problem with that is that sometimes in trying to explain what God is trying to say in the Bible, that you kind of aren't really drawing the correct conclusion. It's just what you think he's trying to say. So it's... It, it, I guess the moral of the story being that you know we need to be careful what we mean by every word is the, of, the, of the Bible is the word of God. Because once again, translations can have errors. Translations are not perfect. It's important that you just kind of read things in different translations and kind of try to get a feel for it. The only other thing I could say is learn Greek, but do you really want to spend two years of your life learning? I mean, probably not. So, um, you know, the word of God... I'm sorry. No, no, I said right. I was agreeing with you. Uh, so the word of God become. Uh, hold on. Okay, I already mentioned that. So, uh, words have a variety of meaning. Some things don't translate well into English. Our culture is more precise. Oh, there's another thing that I didn't really mention, which is p part of the problem with people seeing contradictions in the Bible is that our how we think nowadays is different than how they thought back then. Um, some good examples of this is we are more of a precise and literal culture whereas they weren't so if they quoted somebody they wouldn't try to necessarily get word for word they would try to capture the essence of what was said that's just kind of how they thought and they might even try and draw a conclusion from it like um isaiah say one sentence about your day it was great well, that was a short sentence i expected you to say a little longer oh, okay. did you say a little, like a longer sentence hey, like, it was really oh. great <laughs> it, it was awesome I, I did some school today and then i just chilled out for the rest of the day isaiah said he had a pretty good day so, i mean it capturing the essence of what was said without actually doing a direct quote and that's what they did in ancient cultures quite a deal you know, so if we go to the bible and say it has to be written like we think now two thousand years later or it's a contradiction it's just so far wrong, and uh, so, and then they also we also think about things more precise than they did. Like for instance, the Bible will say um, something, and it's talking about how like the earth was 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 created and how the sky is, and it's talking about it. And so from nowadays, our literal our our precise literal uh, interpretation, we think, I think that the people who wrote the Bible thought that the earth was flat, because to us it sounds like that. But if you put yourself in their shoes, you say, oh, it didn't actually say anywhere that the earth was flat. That's just more of my understanding of what their understanding is. I, I got this. We tend to be more, I don't want to say scientific because that sounds so arrogant, but we just tend to be more like everything has to be perfect or it's wrong. And it's like, it's not like that. They just have a different way of interpreting and thinking about stuff. So let, let's let's move on now. Um, yeah. Matthew chapter two, um, and we've already done a lot of the a lot of the back work with Matthew and Luke chapters one and two and stuff. So we're not really going to go real far or real real much more in this. But the first thing I want to point out is in Matthew chapter two verse two it says this: Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, some people have brought up the fact, well, didn't the Bible kind of condemn astrology? Didn't it talk about how, you know, reading the stars was a bad thing? And here we have, you know, these these people. We don't even know anything really about them. Uh, even the translation of what they are differs. Some people call them magi. Some people call them 
wise people. There's all kinds of these different ideas of what exactly are they. Well, we don't we don't really know. <laughs> we, we we have we have no idea. But there's these these people who come, um, and some people we don't even know how many of them there were. I know everybody says the three wise men, but it doesn't say that there were three. So we don't even know how many they are, where they come from. Okay, they they came from the east somewhere, I guess, and you know now now they're now they're here, and it's like, well, well what's going on? Here? Well, we don't really know. Um, but here it, it seems to imply that they are looking at the stars. They're they're finding something there, and that the Bible is totally condoning it. That's totally fine. And um, so without getting into the idea of whether or not the Bible is condoning it, I, I do want to kind of point something out. The star that they looked that they saw it announced Christ's birth. It didn't foretell it, and that's kind of a big <laughs> difference. Astrology is where you look to the stars to read the future. Tomorrow I will have good luck because the stars were like this. I saw this sign in the heavens, which means Isaiah is going to go bald. You know that would be that would be the equivalent of astrology. Um, I want to know if I'm going to succeed at this job, so I'm going to butcher this animal and look at the liver. That would be that would be you know th that kind of idea, trying to discern the future from that. Well, that's not really what they were doing. They they saw a star that announced Christ's birth. It did not foretell. Big difference there. Um, the prophets foretold Christ's coming. The prophets foretold. Okay, so God wants His people to. It's, he says this very in, explicitly in um, Isaiah, I believe. He God wants His people to trust Him, not in these signs. So um, the prophets foretold that Jesus was coming. The stars, no, no. Um, but then also there's kind of another point that people don't really kind of ignore here, and that is that God often uses the heavens as a way of um, proclaiming what's going on. Like, for instance, uh, when Christ comes again, he mentions that there's going to be some signs that, you know, as he's coming, you know, hey, this is, this is it. <laughs> it's like on that part on Shrek 2 where they're all getting out of the, out of the carriage. This is it. This is it. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's kind of like that. There's going to be things like that going on where they kind of announce, hey, this is what's happening. Um, and so God oftentimes uses the, the heavens. In fact, in Genesis, he says that he's creating the, the, the sun and the star, the sun and the stars and the moon and all this as a way of, you know, um, keeping track of times and to tell events. Okay, I can't remember exactly how he says it. I'm kind of butchering the quote there. Um let them be for signs and and you know when I'm I'm not gonna look it up forget about it just Some, somewhere in Genesis in Genesis chapter one when he's creating it he says that so um it, however God tells us not to look for mystical revelation of the future in the stars there's a complete difference okay so um I know those things really seem similar but when you actually take a closer look you see that there was actually no astrology going on with the wise men Matthew chapter two verse twenty three. And once again, this point that point might have been a, might have been moot anyways because if the if if the Bible isn't even, if the Bible isn't condoning what the Magi did, then it really doesn't even matter <laughs> because I mean the Bible oftentimes records things without condoning it. So, verse twenty three says, and came, um, I'll I'll start in this sentence before, which is in verse twenty two. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and settled in a city called Nazareth. This happens so that, so that what was spoken through the prophets could be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Now, here's the problem is that there is no prophecy in the Old Testament that says that. There is no single prophecy that says that. It, it just said that uh, this happens so that what was spoken through the prophets would be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. That's not in the Old Testament. That's not in the prophets. So it sounds like, well, hey, hold on. We've got a little bit of a problem here. But here, here's, the, here's the thing. Um, uh, it's kind of important to bring this up. First off, this is the only place where Matthew says this. Spoken through the prophets, plural, prophets. He's not quoting one verse. He's saying, I'm just going to summarize what the prophets were talking about. And this is what they were prof th th They were talking about how he's going to be called a Nazarene. So if you look in the Old Testament, you're not going to find that, that verse where it says he will be called a Nazarene. But what you will find are two different things. First off, Nazarene comes from a root word that means branch, and the Bible and the prophets oftentimes talk about how Jesus is going to be the branch. Jesus even talked about this himself, so um, the branch of Jesse or whatever it's called. Um, another thing is that Nazareth is it was a, kind of a term for being despised. 
Um, so think about um, people, a, a people group or an area that people look down on. Um, maybe you could say um, um, Biden lover, or I don't know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's just a joke. Um, <laughs> well, back then, Nazareth was more of a, you know, a lowly term. This, oh, them, the people on the other side of the tracks. <laughs> Um, 50 years ago, it might have been equivalent to the N-word, maybe. I don't know. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch. But just you, you kind of see what I'm saying, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, and so with that being said, Jesus was very much so despised. Um, in fact, this is something that a lot of the prophets talked about. He would be despised and rejected. Um, and uh, so all these things are true. In fact, there was one point when, when um, one of Jesus' soon-to-be disciples said, Come meet this guy. And one of the other soon to be disciples says, Does anything good come from Nazareth? That's like what he's saying. He's like, Oh, it's Nazareth, though. You probably are wrong. And uh, so, okay. Um, the the fact that there is no li literal verse that says that isn't really a problem because it, it, it has its own thing. So, um, as far as John the Baptist, uh, I don't really want to spend too much time looking at his specific spot. Just kind of bringing some stuff up about how the Bible talks about John the Baptist. As far as we can tell, there's only unity is in the John in everything that it talks about John the Baptist. There's only unity between the Gospels about who he who he was and what his message was. John John didn't claim to be the Christ in any of the Gospels. All of the Gospels say that he he never said that. That when people asked him, that he was always like, "Nope, um, I'm just I'm just I'm the herald. I'm I'm, I'm announcing what's about to come." So, you know, they all agree on that. They all agree on what he said about you brood of vipers and he, they, about how he was preaching the repentance and all this stuff. That, they all agree on that. Um, he always pointed to Christ. They all agree on that. John, Mark, Matthew, they all agree. Um, the Gospels agree that he was arrested on account of Herodias, that, the, that, the, that Herod's, you know, the whole, this guy married his brother's wife and, and, and that um, they all agree that that was what, what happened and that he got arrested. There's unanimous agreement there. Um, at Jesus' baptism, it very clearly says about the signs that happened with Jesus being baptized with the dove and all this different stuff. They, they word it slightly different, but it's the same event. It's either the spirit descended in bodily form as a dove or the spirit descended as a dove, You know, depending on which gospels you read. They all agree on that. Um, however, they do draw a, ten a different attention on to who actually heard the voice of God. Um, one of them says that it was John the Baptist who heard God speaking, this is my son. One of them says that it was Jesus who heard. Now, this isn't a contradiction. The different gospels just say, mention a different person hearing. Okay, so like, let's for instance, let's for instance say, I am God, okay? And I say to all of you, um, Jamie just walked in the door. Okay, so I, I, I said that to all of you, right? But then let's say that, I'm re and that, that we're retelling this later and Isaiah says, Michael told me, that Jamie walked in the door. Well, there's not a contradiction here. He didn't say he told me and only me. Nobody else heard. He didn't say that. Neither did the gospel say that. So, um, as far as we can tell, all the main things with John the Baptist, and even even down to how he worded things, all the gospels agree with this. Uh, there's really no contradiction there. Um, now, uh, one thing I do want to mention is when Jesus was baptized and the dove descended and the voice of God spoke, others may have may have um, may have uh, heard and, and saw as well, besides just John and Jesus, we don't really know how many people were there. But either way, um, so then that brings up a question that I wanted to just really quickly answer. Why was Jesus baptized? Well, this is uh, something that if you think about it, it doesn't make sense, but then if you think about it a little, a little longer, it, doesn't, it does. Um, so Jesus, being God, wouldn't have had to be baptized because he had no sin to be baptized. <laughs> right, he didn't have to come to the faith, <laughs> you know, like, I have faith in myself, you know what I mean? Like, you <laughs> wouldn't have had to do that. <laughs> so, you know, from, from that aspect, he didn't really need to be baptized because, you know. But so then why did he? He was baptized for the same reason he followed the law. While he was alive, he, he lived under the law. He lived under the Jewish law. In fact, Jesus, for his, for his first coming, was Jewish. So... You know, this is this is something that he did. He, he he committed himself to that, and he also paid the temple tax too, even though he didn't have to, being God once again. <laughs> but he said, <laughs> but he once again submitted to all these things so as to fulfill the law, 
which is something he said that he came to do. Another reason is to fulfill righteousness, um, so that way you know he would be up to up to the standard of what was what what the what the Messiah had to have done, um, and also as a sign to others. So now that we've waded through that, Luke chapter two says there's I think one or two two. Pretty much one thing from Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 says, <coughs> Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Now I know that we mentioned this two weeks ago with um, this, the, um, the census with, um, what's his face? Uh, what's his name? Quirinius. But um, I never actually mentioned about Caesar Augustus's um, census, so I thought I'd backtrack a little bit and mention that real quick before we move on. First off, the emperor had periodic um, registrations that he would do. Um, as far as we can tell, they happened every 14 years. Um, this was a way for him to, you know, uh, know who he was recruiting for military service, get all the taxes that were due him, that kind of stuff. Um, so th this was this was a normal thing that happened. Um, and then uh, the issue being, well, there was there really a census done at this time? And it really doesn't matter too much if it was in this year that the census happened because – so they would give it – they would give a census, and then it would take time to complete. Um, one census, for instance, that I was reading about took 40 years to complete. So if in Rome they said, hey, we're going to do this census, and then it went out to the governors of the different areas, and then from there it went down, down to the people – it, it could be – even when the governor started working on it, it could still be you know years before he actually got the job done. So, I mean, it, it's not – it shouldn't really trouble us that much. I mean, if Jesus was born in, let's say, like 6 BC or something like that, 3 BC, it doesn't matter where, just somewhere around there. And let's say that the order for a uh, census was, was given out in like, I don't know, 20 BC or something. Well, it, it shouldn't bother us that much if it took that long to filter down into the – I mean – even nowadays, it takes the government forever to do anything, and they've got internet, they've got phones, they've got cars. Back then, they didn't have any of that stuff. So if it takes them that long for something as simple nowadays, well, let's backtrack 2,000 years and say, yes, it, you know, things take a little bit of time. So, okay, um, a census took a while to complete. I just mentioned that. Uh, local, local governors were, were involved in the process, so it was something where it, it took a while. Um, and then also uh, when a emperor needed to take oaths that people would stay loyal to him, they used to do those like oaths of what they called fealty or whatever. Well, back then they would use a census sometimes as a means of accomplishing that. When you went into register, it'd kind of be like, hey, I support you. <laughs> um, so um, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention about that. Um, There are, I mentioned uh, – another thing I mentioned two weeks ago is we were talking about the genealogies, and I was talking about how they followed two different lines, that they were not the same. So what some people have done is they've seen the same names appearing in both genealogies, and they're, oh, well, hold on. We got a connection. No, not really. Those names were kind of you know popular, and so the fact that they were in both doesn't mean that we're talking about the same person. That, that doesn't really mean anything at all. Um, once again, the, the, this is really stretching. Like on, on one, it talks about um, – what's the person's name? Um, well, one one thing is, uh, and one part of the Bible is talking about Rahab. And when we think of Rahab, we think of Rahab the harlot from the book of Joshua. But <laughs> no, that when that other place is not talking about her. So, anyways, moral story being, don't let that bother you. Um, David, uh, King David, is in both genealogies, though. Um, so, and the last thing I believe we're looking at. Is Matthew chapter 4 and this will take us all the way into where Jesus actually starts teaching um, there were some events that we didn't actually have to look at at all for contradictions because they were only in one gospel like uh, the wedding that Jesus goes to and changes the water into wine that's only in one gospel so we didn't have to look for contradictions there <laughs> um, okay Matthew chapter 4 and that takes us to the temptation of Jesus now, if you read the t the, the t when Jesus is tempted, it mentions it in detail in two of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke. 
Mark simply says that he was taken out into the desert where he was tempted, and I think he says nurtured by, ali by aliens. <laughs> angels! <laughs> nurtured by angels! And then it moves on. Like, that's all it says. It's like part of one verse. So, you know, th th that's something where... The, and then John doesn't mention the, the temptation in the wilderness at all. So when we're looking at a contradiction here, we had to just go between these two. And they're, they're the same. They, they have very similar wording. Uh, nothing is a contradiction there. The, 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 some some of its words are slightly different, and one of them is slightly longer than the other one. But there is no actual contradiction here. Um, the big issue is that the the, the events happen a in a different order. Um, in in Matthew, it starts with uh, chapter four, and it goes, "He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He had excuse me. He had fasted forty days. This the tempter came and said to him, "Hey, if you're the Son of God." turn the stone into bread, and then the next thing he does is he takes him to the temple and, and has him, you know, uh, tempts him to, to jump off, and then the other thing is he shows him uh, the kingdoms of the world. Well, in Luke, the order is different. It starts with the bread, the same as that, but then it goes on to the kingdoms of the world, and then it goes to um, the him standing at the precipice of the temple. Now, um, the most probable answer to this is that they weren't both trying to be chronological. So uh, Matthew was probably saying it in the order that it happened. Hey, these are the three tests in the order, this, and then this, and then this. But if you read in Luke, Luke has this way of trying to make it more dramatic. For instance, um, in Luke, it shows Jesus, everything kind of climaxes in Jerusalem. And then Acts, which is also written by Luke, starts in, in, in Jerusalem, and then it goes out to all the world. So, like, for instance, in Luke, it starts with the census of the emperor in Rome, you know, and it filters down and, and it has its climactic moment in Jerusalem, and then it, the book ends. See what I mean? So Luke is more interested in having that climactic thing of, of, of Jerusalem, um, whereas Matthew is not so much, so he, he doesn't really do it in that order. If you look at um, Matthew, it says, okay, then the devil took him here. Again, the devil took him. But, but and if you read in Luke, it doesn't say that. It says... Um, Luke connects the events by saying, and um, and this happened, and this happened. He doesn't say then. In other words, he's not saying it in this happened and then this happened. He said this temptation happened, and this temptation happened, and this temptation happened. In other words, he's not trying to say what order the events happened. He's just saying these are the three temptations. And he says it in that way so he can show his climactic moment in Jerusalem. Um like I said, the the wording of both accounts is is very similar. Nothing is a contradiction. It's it's just that one is a little bit lengthier than the other one, and worded slightly different. Nothing 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 there to worry is too much there, um, and they both carry the exact same meaning. You can read them back to back if you like. I'm not gonna spend any time with it. We've already, we've already spent 20 minutes just looking at what we have. So, um, the next thing, Matthew 4:14. 4, any questions on that one or the other ones? No. Okay, all right. 414 through 16 says, This happened so that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet would be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, uh, the people... Am I in the right book? <laughs> the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in, in land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. So... Here we have a little bit of a problem because when you go into Isaiah and you read it, it's you're going to see that it's not the same. Now, this, this once again bothers a modern audience more than it would have bothered an ancient one. And that's because he did accurately cite Isaiah. He just didn't quote the full passage. He paraphrased it. Now, before we get too upset about that, did you know that in scholarly articles today, people still paraphrase things? Hey, it's like this person said here, and you give like a summary of what was said. People do that all the time, even nowadays. So the fact that he didn't give us an exact quote of what Isaiah the prophet said shouldn't really bother us that much. He paraphrased. He correctly cited it, it's just that he paraphrased it. Um, so it's not verbatim, but once again, if, if everything has to be verbatim, then that means modern research, modern history, and the modern news is all not right. That means you can never watch CNN or Fox. You can never read a history book. You can never read a history article. You can never – I mean everything becomes nothing. You know what I mean? It, if you only allow for verbatim quotes, you kind of just shoot yourself in the foot. So this, once again, isn't so much a 
um, contradiction in the Bible. It's just people wanting the Bible to be written in a certain way that isn't really fair because that's not really how people write. So, uh, okay, I already mentioned that Mark only mentions Jesus was tempted. doesn't really go into detail. I mentioned that. Um, so in the Gospels, guys, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before we close up uh, for the night, um, and then we'll pick up next week talking about the things that Jesus actually taught and looking at contradictions there. The Gospels will frequently say the same thing, but slightly different. They won't all match in, in like, word for word, like, if you compare the wording over and over again. Like, for instance, here's a good example. In the, in the Gospel of John, um, did you notice how Jesus talks really weird in the Gospel of John? In all the other Gospels, he talks a certain way, but then in John, it's like, he just has this weird and confusing way of saying things. Well, that's because what what's said in the Gospel of John isn't verbatim. John's putting it in his own words. And if you read First John, and then you read the Gospel of John, you see John is rewording what Jesus said. Once again, he didn't feel like this was being dishonest, and he was very close with Jesus. In fact, he called himself the, God, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. So this was a guy that was very close with Jesus, and he did not feel like he was being dishonest, and neither did the other disciples, because John was one of the elders. <laughs> So if they had a problem with what John was doing, they probably would have said something, and they didn't. Um, so once again, this, sh this shouldn't bother us. This is him wording it in his own way. Like, have you ever been in school and they say, hey, put this in your own words? John is trying to, sh trying to show us something and teach us something about Jesus, but he does it in his own words to get us there. Matthew didn't do this. Peter and, and Mark. Peter was the guy behind the Gospel of Mark, so Peter. Uh, and Luke, they didn't do that. They had their own thing that they were doing. That's fine. John wasn't trying to be so precise about what Jesus said. He was more trying to trying to help us to learn from Jesus and to get kind of the idea of what Jesus was trying to say. Um, so this is something that you just kind of have to be okay with. Um, because if you wanted four different books that said the exact same thing over and over again, you would have to get the same person to write it down. But the fact that the four Gospels are written by four different people, it's going to be slightly worded a little bit different because everybody has their own way of writing. Have you ever known, Have you ever graded like a paper, for instance, and you just kind of see, oh, this is how that student writes? It could be completely factual paper. It could be, you know, maybe an A-plus paper, a really good paper. And maybe this other student's was too, and they did a good job on it too. But you can tell their writing style, and that's kind of kind of the same thing what's happening is, you know, they're, they're accurately telling us about Jesus, they're just doing – they're getting to the finish line their own way. And so when you read like Matthew, and it'll say that Jesus said this, and you read in Luke, and it says, that's not exactly what he said word for word. He said it slightly differently here. No, <laughs> it's just recorded a little bit differently. But it's the same concept. The same idea is being said. He still said, for instance, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It just – he got – he. it's just recorded a little bit differently. Okay, like let's say, for instance, um, I'm quoting Isaiah, and I say, hey, uh, Isaiah said this, or and then another, uh, then some, Gracie's writing down what Isaiah said, and she says, um, and what's your middle name, Isaiah? Thomas. That's what I thought I was going to say, but I didn't want to say Thomas and Good be like, you know, um, and then Gracie says, well, Thomas said that. Well, now hold on, you know, it's like, well, different ways of saying it, same thing. Yeah. The, the thing, the thing that makes it a, a contradiction is that they're two exclusive statements. So just because it's worded slightly different doesn't make it a contradiction. It's slight variations. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> you, we really can't get carried away because about 90% of contradictions, and I'm skipping most of them for the next couple weeks, is people saying, see, there's there's a slight difference in how, how the gospel said it. Well, no, there, there's not. It's just two different ways of saying it. So you have to look at, is the main point the same? And then take it from there. Is it, are these two mutually exclusive statements? Did Jesus, for instance, say, I am a man, and then said, I am a woman? Those would have been two mutually exclusive statements. He can't be both. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So you have to look at that. If you, if you see some spot in the, in the Gospels and Jesus says it slightly differently here than he did here, look at it and say, is, the, is it the same basic idea? And are these, are these two concepts, can they not mix? So it didn't have to be an exact quote. That's just how they wrote back then. We oftentimes do the same thing nowadays, so don't get too bent out of shape there. Um, it had to accurately relay what was said. You had to maintain the, con the, the idea of what the person was trying to get across, not the exact verbiage. Um, this is common, common practice even today. Well, I went to the store to get some eggs. Michael said that he went grocery shopping at Walmart. Well, it's the same idea. I said I was going shopping. 
Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, what? So, yeah, exactly. Like they, they both, the both those statements, they say the same thing, and that's what the gospels oftentimes do. They'll, they'll, they're, they're saying the same thing, it's just slightly worded a little bit differently. Right. So, um, omit, and then another thing is omitting some parts of a sentence is completely normal and does make it a contradiction. Let's say, for instance, I say, today, I drove back from Las Cruces, picked up some crickets, and then I had had some lunch and I came back home. And then somebody else is, is, is quoting me, and they said, Michael said they came home from Las Cruces and had lunch. No. You the See what I mean? Like, yeah. you, lopping off a part of a sentence is not misquoting. It's just, you. I don't really care about Summarize. the crickets. I, I don't care about the crickets. You know what I mean? And that's what the Gospels oftentimes do. They'll, they'll say something that Jesus said something, and they're like, okay, I, this doesn't really matter. Just drop that out. And a good example of this we looked at two weeks ago when they are talking about John the Baptist, and he says, um... Uh, uh, he he will baptize you with 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 the with the Holy Spirit and water. How some of the gospels lop off the and water part, it it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. The same it's the same idea that's being portrayed. You know. Anyways, so uh, I hope we we all understand understand this because I don't really want to spend too much of the next couple weeks. I just kind of want to start going through the more the big things. And why I made such a big deal of it about it tonight, guys, is because if I went to every single contradiction in the Gospels that did what I just said, that, that I just ex spent 20 minutes or 10 minutes explaining just now, we would literally be stuck in the Gospels for the next two years. Like, there's so many times when, when it's, see, that's a contradiction, and it's not a contradiction. It's two people recording the same thing slightly differently. There's nothing major that's being lost here. So, um, I decided to just have that little 10-minute ex explanation so that we wouldn't have to waste months on this so we'll go to it's you know just more stuff in the gospels that there's so many contradictions no it's all throughout the bible yeah um we've looked at a lot of contradictions uh we looked at um we looked at in the, in the law we looked at uh, in the history but yeah yeah they're all over the place and uh, there's a lot of books uh, you know explaining the different things because and we talked about this a couple weeks ago things that look like contradictions nowadays that really aren't they really yeah. aren't yeah but then back then they were a big deal well, they weren't a big deal back then. Yeah. It's only recently become a big deal because we don't understand <laughs> it. And so rather than trying to understand it, we just say, well, it must be wrong. Right. Yeah, because I know everything, and so it must be wrong. Well, sure. <laughs> so we, should, we have to remember that the, the Bible is written by, like, what was it? How many different authors? 40 different authors? 30 plus. 30 so plus. It, 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 you yeah. are going to get the same words from 40 different people. Right, and they, they all have different viewpoints. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the Bible, you know, it, it agrees with itself. <coughs> you know, it, it very obviously has some has you know a God behind it and everything. But to to say that the people's characteristic doesn't come out is just I mean that's just wrong. Right. I mean God could use both of us. Let's say for instance to write a sermon. Okay. So I write a sermon. You write a sermon. They're they're both really good sermons. They're they're going to be different. Yours is going to have your your point of view. Mine's going to have my character. I mean that's just the way it is. You right. know, we don't all write. We don't all write the same stuff. So. Right, we have different. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, does everybody understand all that? Yeah.